So I made this Minecraft clone in C++, but it's a little weird to see light pouring in underground and under mountains. So in this episode, I'm going to add voxel lighting to make the world feel much more believable. First though, it's pretty annoying to have to create this big texture map, so I decided to make an automatic texture atlas generator that takes in individual textures and turns them into a texture map at runtime. The way this works is by getting the dimensions of the texture map first. It starts at two textures by two textures. It compares the number of available texture slots to the number of textures present, and if there are too many textures, it multiplies the x-axis by two and compares again. If it still fails, it then doubles the y-axis. It keeps doing this until the texture atlas is big enough. Then it places all of the textures onto the texture atlas and creates the block definitions using the texture coordinates. I made this live on stream on YouTube and Twitch, so here are some highlights from that. I started by creating a test texture to test out runtime generated textures. Okay, perfect. Look at that, guys. It worked. We created this texture at runtime and we loaded it in, so that's step one. I then tried generating the actual texture atlas. I really don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> so it crashes. Cool. All right, so channels, width, height. Yeah, these definitely aren't correct. <laughs> Assets block, dirt block, dot PNG. That does exist here, right? No. Okay. Assets, textures. All right, there we go. All right, I mean, it doesn't really work, but it's not crashing either. Look at that. That's closer. So we have this strange pattern here. It looks like it's trying to load in a dirt block. Um, not sure why it's like this, but you know, it's a start. Oh, wait. Oh, you know, it would really help if I did atlas width and atlas height. <laughs> That's why it looks like it was two by two because i set it to be two by two well it's still two by two <laughs> it's two by two in here <laughs> it's still setting it to two by two for some reason oh wait never mind because i didn't i'm such an idiot yeah i i did it in textures instead of in pixels it's working look at it we got our dirt the dirt textures there it's beautiful so now if we do all three of these textures we should get all three of the textures yeah look at that so now we just need to set the right texture coordinates we, it works we have our dirt our stone grass so now all we need to do is actually add support for using like you know multiple textures for this look at that we got all of our textures one more thing before lighting. Lighting calculations are going to be pretty expensive, and we're already getting frame drops when we're modifying terrain. To fix this, I decided to create a thread pool to move lighting and remesh operations away from the main thread. First, I made this simple thread pool class that uses a lock-free queue by Cameron314. I then switched the chunk manager over to use this thread pool. However, it's sometimes even laggier than before. One issue I noticed was that when breaking a chunk, these holes can appear in the meshes. This is due to the asynchronous nature of the thread pool. Another issue was that queuing many jobs at once can cause huge lag spikes. At first, I thought this was just the nature of the on queue function, but looking at the benchmarks, mine feels quite slow compared to what's seen in the graph. So then I thought maybe I was doing something wrong. Then I realized the real reason for this lag was likely due to locking the mutex for the trunk renderer an ordered map, because we're still locking it every time a new trunk is loaded in and when the player breaks a block. As a result of using this thread pool, the chunk thread now adds chunk data and chunk renderers to the map much more quickly than it used to, which is probably what's causing these lag spikes when the player interacts with these chunks. For now, I just stopped using the thread pool for initial generation. Since since they're being generated apart from the main thread anyway. This prevents these huge lag spikes from happening. It's a bit of a temporary solution, but I'll get back to this later in the video. As for the issue that the chunks were being remeshed on different frames leading to holes, I fixed this by creating a new type of job that generates all of the relevant meshes first before marking them all dirty afterwards. This way, the new meshes don't apply and render until all of them are ready. This seems to have fixed the issue. I'm sure there will still be some scenarios where only some of the chunks are set as dirty before the chunk logic runs simply due to the nature of multi-threading, but if it starts to become an issue, we can make a more robust solution later. Now it's time to add lighting. I started by doing a live stream where I added intra trunk lighting. We're going to do light levels and it's just, you know, going to be for every single voxel. For right now, we're just going to do some test code. This is, we're not doing a flood fill right now. And then we're just going to say light levels index x, y, z is equal to x plus y plus z for right now. Out float light multiplier light multiplier so we're gonna just do light level this times level light multiplier in float light multiplier that times light multiplier the result is equal to ambient time or plus lighting i don't i don't know if any of this is gonna work but we're gonna try it okay so not quite <laughs> Okay, and now it's pretty much entirely white except for this one block. Wait, there's another one. I'm going to assume that these are all at zero, zero, zero. Yeah. So the problem is that they're not floats now. What if I just do this? Does that work? Yes. <laughs> It's beautiful. This is what I remember Minecraft looking like. We do need to cap it at one. Let's cap this at one. So now it kind of caps out at a certain point. Actually, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I know why, because I did max instead of min. This should be min, not max. Yep. All right, there we go. So now it now it caps out at one. So it's not going to go above that. So now you just get these weird dark corners. So now that leads us to the fourth step, which is to actually do lighting calculations. 
like proper ones. All right, so this is just gonna get the block definition and then we can say if block dot light emitter and that's where we can add things to a queue. We're gonna create a queue of these light emissions while emissions dot empty. This is where we do the actual flood fill. And we can pop it and then we can calculate the next light level. We can get all of these surrounding blocks. If it's inbounds, we can say if get light level greater than or equal to, I guess it would be next light level. Then continue, set light level, next light level. Check if it is solid, then we can add to the emissions queue. So we're gonna register glowstone. We're actually gonna set this to the selected block. <laughs> Okay, you guys couldn't see what I just saw. Let me let me show you. <laughs> five, one, two, three, four, five, six error messages. They they showed up one by one, which looked really funny, and I wish I could have captured it on stream, but I I did not. Invalid block ID zero. What? So it gets an error whenever you try to get error. So we're just gonna need to add error first. Generate block definitions. Perfect. Okay, so. <laughs> so I placed the glowstone down, and I. I just, I don't even know how to explain what's going on right here. <laughs> I'm going to assume if I comment out this code and I do this, then it'll work. All right, I, I fixed the texture issue. The lighting is also just not working at all. The, the entire chunk just gets lit up. <laughs> I know how to fix it, go into the code and fix it. That is a good idea. I should probably try that at some point. Right now it's kind of acting like I don't have this minus minus here. Oh wait, never mind. I know why it doesn't work because I'm a freaking idiot. <laughs> I did minus minus, just, I should have done. Minus one. Holy crap. <laughs> guys, I'm actually a moron. The fuck? Yo, it actually, like it, it works, guys. Like it looks like Minecraft lighting. Well, it looks like beta Minecraft lighting, I should say. After the stream, I started working on interchunk lighting. The first thing we need to do is pass the neighboring chunks to the calculate lighting function. Then when recalculating the lighting, we add the light emitters from the neighboring chunks to the light emission queue. Finally, for right now, if the emission is outside the bounds of the chunk, I just push the next emission to the queue without doing any checks or light value setting. This is so slow that I ran out of disk space recording it before I ever finished calculating the lighting. I then tried creating an unordered map for out of bounds light levels and using that in the calculations. And yes, I know that this is like the worst possible solution, but I wanted something functional and this was the fastest solution to implement. It did not work very well at first, but I eventually got it working. Of course, I now need to rematch the surrounding chunks every time I modify a block to update the lighting. This comes with another issue. The lighting calculations are very slow. It's time to make some big changes. First, the chunk data now requests all of its surrounding chunks for the chunk manager when it goes to update its lighting. It then caches the surrounding chunks. Now, instead of calculating lighting from the chunk renderer, the chunk manager creates remesh jobs to immediately update the chunk meshes. Then, it calls light calculation jobs on the chunk, which updates the lighting for all surrounding chunks as well. This is definitely a big improvement. However, there are many issues. Obviously, the lighting calculations are still really slow, but I wanted to fix some job scheduling issues beforehand. If anything, the slow lighting is good for testing the efficiency of the jobs. You can see that when I place or break a whole bunch of blocks very quickly, there are massive frame drops and it takes absolutely absolutely forever to redo the lighting calculations. On top of that, the chunks start regenerating the mesh while lighting is still being calculated, leading to lots of weird lighting issues. A big cause of the lag is the massive amount of mutex locking going on in each thread. This seems pretty unavoidable. However, I just learned that shared mutexes exist, which allow multiple threads to access a resource at once as long as they are not writing to it. So yeah, for those of you thinking that you don't know enough to start your own project like this, just know that everything I know about C++ I learned from moments just like this. Genuinely though, how did it take this long for a shared mutex to come up with my research. I've done so much research about multi-threading. In any case, I implemented that and that completely removed the frame drops. This makes sense because the lag was caused by absurd numbers of read operations. I'm not going to show every function that changed as a result of the shared mutexes because they aren't that interesting, but you can of course see them with the repo in the description. While the lighting job is still slow, I want to make one more optimization to job scheduling, job canceling. Here's an example. The player breaks a block. This means the lighting needs to get recalculated. While the lighting job is running, the player breaks another block, invalidating the lighting the job is still generating. On top of that, the game now needs to wait until the first lighting job is finished to start the next one, causing correct lighting to be delayed even further. To fix this, I want to cancel the first lighting job when the player breaks the second block. I added a version number to chunk renderers and chunk data. Periodically throughout the jobs, it'll check to see if the version changed and stop the job if it did. I then change these version numbers when scheduling the jobs. The change isn't very obvious, but the jobs are being canceled now. With that, it's finally time to improve the lighting calculations. For this to work, we're going to need a whole new lighting engine. Instead of completely recalculating 
calculating the lighting for all 27 chunks that surround every block we update, we'll instead just change the lighting around the block that was modified. We'll have different lighting functions for when a player adds a light source, removes a light source, adds a non-light source, and removes a non-light source. The algorithms for each of these will be very efficient and only modify the necessary blocks. A lot of the information and algorithms come from a Reddit blog post linked in the description. I started by creating a light node struct that contains information for breadth first search. Using that, I made this function for adding a light emitter. It runs a BFS algorithm starting from the new light source. If it runs into neighboring chunks, it adds that chunk to a set of chunks to remesh. There are some optimizations to only propagate lighting to blocks that are darker than the new value as well. I then changed the chunk mesh generation to get the light level from the block above the current block. As you can see, I can place down the glowstone and it very quickly propagates the light. However, if I go over to the mountain, you can see that getting the light level from the block above is not working for walls. Because of this, I'm going to have to get the lighting of the neighboring block for every face when remeshing a chunk. With this change, the lighting looks much better than it did before. It's still very quick too. The next step is to create a function for destroying a light source. For that, I made this light removal node struct to store information for removing light. We do a very similar process as before, but for each neighbor to a node, we remove the light value if it's less than the value of the node's light level. If the neighbor's light value is greater than or equal to the current node's light level, it adds it to the light level propagation queue. Then at the very end, it runs the add light emitter function on everything in the light propagation queue. What this essentially does is remove any light values that could have come from the destroyed light source and then re-adds any light that comes from other light sources. This works perfectly and is still very fast. Now the lighting updates when we place or break a light source, but not when we place or break a regular block. For placing a regular block, I made this add light blocker that just gets the light level of the block being placed and calls remove light emitter as if it's a light source itself. For removing a regular block, we just get the neighboring block with the highest light level and propagate the light from there. With that, we can now place and break blocks correctly and the lighting gets recalculated quickly and accurately. Now the pitch block error is a little strange, so it's time to add skylighting. This is really, really hard. You see, if we were using chunks like Minecraft that stored the whole height in one chunk, we could simply add sunlight to the top blocks of each chunk. However, we're using cubic chunks. We don't necessarily know what the top block is. We're going to have to find some sort of way to find the top block, even when the top block is in a chunk that has never been loaded in before. For now though, let's just assume that the top of the chunk is the top of the world so we can add skylighting itself. Skylighting works the exact same way as block lighting, except that when we propagate down Word, we don't decrease the light value. Because of this, I'm not going to go over what is practically the same code again. As you can see though, the skylight lights the surface and spreads into darker areas correctly. The weird lighting you see is a result of the top block detection. The skylighting also updates when breaking or placing blocks. After getting skylighting to work, I then change the way it generates to only start skylighting if the chunk is above the surface and is empty. Then it gets the skylight of the neighboring chunks and uses all of that to calculate the skylighting. This results in much more accurate lighting. It actually looks pretty good now. There are no noticeable lighting glitches here anymore. Sadly, I'm completely out of time for this video. In the next video, I'm going to speed up the world generation and add colored lighting, smooth lighting, and ambient occlusion. Subscribe so that you don't miss that. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate it if you left a like on the video and consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. If you have any ideas for future videos, let me know in the comments below. Thank you to my channel members, Ulyss Jen, Miyaki, Mr. NSHS, I'm Santi, JTux, and BrunoMan4006. If you'd like to support me and get early access to new videos, you can become a channel member today. If you want early access to code, you can also join my Patreon. As always, the Project GitHub is in the description as well as links to my Twitch, Discord, and Patreon. I hope you have a good rest of your day and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye!